Captain Connolly to Nee Bomajolid. I want to support this bill. I have no hesitation in supporting it, although, like the previous speaker, I have no illusion that it is going to create equality in our society. And certainly the existing legislation, the two pieces that have been mentioned with the nine grounds for discrimination, are not adequate to prevent discrimination on socio and economic grounds. In relation to the Minister's response, I have read the uh, bill and I, I also see problems with it and the generality of it. But at this point, I do not think that is a reason to reject it. And in fact, Minister, I think you have set out clearly lots of the problems, but what you have ignored are the countries where legislation has been brought in. And I think if you're setting out the problem, it's incumbent on you to also look at the countries where legislation has been brought in successfully and also in relation to our rights. And Deputy O'Leary has already mentioned Article 21, our obligation under that, the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And then if we look at the, 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 the um, recent overview of equality legislation in Europe, prepared by the European Network of Legal Experts, and so, as already been pointed out, and I don't like repetition, 20 of the 35 European countries have already brought in legislation to prevent discrimination on the grounds related to socio-economic status. So at the very least, as a member of the European community, and the government boasts repeatedly as being the best in the class when it comes to the EU, I would have thought we would have looked at the best that's available over there and at least have that before us today. In Belgium, France, Hungary, France is working on a Croatia and so on. I won't waste my time going through the whole lot. But certainly discrimination on any ground prevents full participation in society. And there's an onus on a government when a bill like this comes before you to say the pluses and the minuses in relation to it. And I think what's happened here is you've set your mind fundamentally against um, given rights on a socio-economic ground on any level. Well, I'm delighted you're shaking your head because my colleague Thomas Pringle, who unfortunately is not here and would love to participate in this debate, brought, brought um, used his private member's time in relation to socio-economic rights and there were just absolutely rejected by the government. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Fianna Fáil also uh, didn't support that. So perhaps you might come back in relation to that, Deputy Callanan. In relation to this matter, uh, a year ago, just coincidentally, I uh, raised a question with uh, Deputy Frances Fitzgerald at the time in relation to asking the Minister the steps she was taking to introduce socio-economic status as a discrimination ground following legislative and case law trends across Europe and so on. And Minister, the reply at that time, I do not have plans at this stage to introduce socio-economic status as a discrimination ground in equality legislation. And she goes on to point out that they did not support a private member's bill going back to 2015 in the previous government in relation to inserting in the Constitution a statement in relation to socio-economic grounds. And she clearly makes out in the reply that that the government had no intention of going down that route either in the constitution or on a legislative basis because she believed that the best way to introduce equality was through policies. Now I happen to agree with her in relation to policies but your policies so far have caused discrimination on the ground. Inequality is built into your housing strategy. It's built into the privatisation of the health services and so on. So I'm afraid that I'm left with no option but to agree with Fianna Fáil in relation to this, I don't think it will solve any problem without looking at the policies which Deputy Fitzgerald quite clearly and honestly referred to back in November 16. But unfortunately, the policies of the government, this one and the last one, has built in discrimination. Finally, I'd just like to deal with the comments that are made in relation to local authority houses and local authority estates. I, I actually cringe when I hear this constant mantra about deprivation and criminality and antisocial behaviour in relation to local authority. It is not accurate. It is simply it's a mantra that's repeated over and over. Criminality exists at every level of society. And we've had the bankers, but we don't use the same language at all when it comes to people outside of a local authority state. So I, I would ask people in the stall to be very careful in their use of language in relation to local authority estates. And if I look at them, a lot of the problems have been caused by the negligence of repeated local authority managers, 
and staff at local authority level and government policy in failing to provide enough money and allowing problems get out of hand in a small number of states rather than dealing with them. I have also seen apartments knocked that were under the local authority that were far superior to any of the private accommodation that has gone up in a middle class area in Galway City. So I, I am a little bit, um, more than a little bit, I cringe and I react when I hear this language used repeatedly in terms of deprivation. One has to ask the question, how did some areas result in this label being applied to them? What was the role of the local authority or the inaction or the, the role of the government? And so while I welcome the legislation and I support it and I look forward to detailed scrutiny of it and teasing out the problems, I would also say that we certainly need to look at government policies. Uh, thank you.